Hi everyone, I'm Diana Graber. I'm the founder of Cyber Civics and Cyberwise and also the author of Raising Humans in the Digital World. I'm here to show you um, level two of cyber civics, which is information literacy. All right, so hopefully you know about us. Uh, we're a comprehensive middle school digital literacy, digital literacy program. We teach kids three different things, digital citizenship, information literacy, which I'm just about to show you, and media literacy. And our goal is to help students become ethical, safe, and productive digital citizens. Um, the program was founded 12 years ago, hard, hard to believe it's been that long, at Journey School in Southern California. It's a public charter Walder school that my own children attended. It was developed in response to the school's very first cyberbullying incident. And in that time, it has grown substantially. It is now being taught in 48 US states and seven other countries, not only in school, but also by homeschoolers and after school programs. All right, so it's a three level program, as I mentioned. Um, it starts with digital citizenship, which is normally taught in fifth or sixth grade. Um, the first couple of years, we just delivered that level one. And in doing so, we realized that while we'd given kids really great foundational skills on how to be safe and responsible online, that's not nearly enough. It is a drop in the bucket. Kids really need to learn how to use their tools as information sources. And we were learning from the research that kids were not getting those skills at all. So information literacy, how to find, retrieve, analyze, and use online information is such an important skill. And because we could not find a comprehensive curriculum that taught that, we created one ourselves. It, like the whole entirety of cyber civics, it really sequences lessons in a way that makes sense and helps kids understand how to use the powerful devices they have in really creative, wonderful ways. All right, so that's what we're gonna look at today. Um, quick overview about the curriculum. It's developmentally appropriate. As I just mentioned, we worked really hard to sequence lessons in a way that makes sense to students and meets them where they are. Um, the lessons in level two are hands-on. It's about neurology and not technology. Proactive, we're very, um, really focus on empowering youth with skills to use technology safely and wisely. And finally, not fear-based. We want to teach students how to harness the power of digital technology in really positive ways. All right, so level two um, it is broken down into six different units. Every unit has between two and six lessons in it. Every lesson is designed to be teach, taught in about 50 minutes. Um, some lessons will extend over two class periods, but there is enough content in this level to get a teacher through an entirety of a school year if it's taught once a week. So we're going to look at each of these units, starting with level one. Now, we start with a level one um, learning balance. And as you see here on the left hand side, this is the course overview that a teacher sees when they log into their own private portal to get all the lesson resources. And you'll see here on the bottom, uh, every unit starts with a teacher guide, and the teacher guide is great. It's just a page or two long. It takes three minutes to read it, but basically it just gives the teacher any kind of background information they may, might need to teach the lessons in this unit. Um, also, in the beginning of each unit, you'll find a letter that you can send home to parents or guardians, and you can write in the date you teach the lesson, but basically this letter has activities that can be done at home with families that will support every lesson that you teach in the classroom. And this is really important because we know that digital media happens 24 seven. So we really wanna get the whole community on board. All right, so again, when a teacher logs into their own private portal, this is what they see when they click a lesson. The lesson plan will appear on the left. They can read it online or they can download it and have a piece of paper to deliver it in the classroom. And so in their downloads, they have the lesson plan, they have slides, we give them to teachers, both um, in PowerPoint and Google Slides, and then a student packet if there's student work that goes along with the lesson. Okay, so you might wonder why we start information literacy with learning balance. Well, you know, screen time has gone up a lot, especially after the pandemic. And we really wanna address this hands on, hand, head on before we dive into our lessons. So just, you know, a little research, we know that Recreational screen time doubled during the pandemic and has affected mental health. So we want kids to take a good look at how they spend their time. So again, there's the teacher lesson plan. You can read it like a script to know how to deliver the lessons. You'll see there how it aligns with um, educational standards. You'll get a set of slides if you choose to use them in the classroom. So this actually comes from the student slides. Normally, this is kind of the pattern of how our lessons go. You'll start with the class discussion. 
pose a question. Do you have screen time rules at home? And then talk about it. Every student, every family, and even school has different habits and roles. If your school has screen time rules, this is a great time to talk about them. And remember to be non-judgmental about how much or how little others use digital media. If you taught level one, you'll remember that we encourage kids to be detectives. Same thing here. This is not a judgment. This is just, we're gonna take a really hard look at how different people use media throughout all of these lessons. All right, so you would pose another question to the kids, digital media, let's talk about this. Any form of media distributed by electronic devices. What comes to mind when you think of digital media? And so this is when the kids kind of brainstorm the different kind of digital media they may have used over the summer. All right, so we have some videos in the lessons too. These are all designed by us. They're short, they're kid friendly. Uh, this is a new one that we just added to level two. I'm gonna play it for you and then I will explain how the activity aligns with it. Time is precious. I mean, think about it. We only have so much of it. You can't buy more of it. And when you use it up, well, it's gone forever. Bye-bye. So how do you spend your time? For lots of people, time is spent both online and offline sometimes at the same time. We text, we tweet, we post, share, and like, and all of this takes up our time. Think of it this way. Suppose you spend two hours a day watching videos. Now, suppose you kept that up for the next, say, 40 years. Let's see. There's 365 days in a year times two hours a day times 40 years. Yikes. <gasps> That's 29,200 hours of time you can't get back. The nice thing is, every day you are given opportunities to make new choices on how you spend your time. It's always smart to take a good, hard look at how you are actually using the hours in your day. For most of us, this yields some big surprises. Once we have this data, we can decide for ourselves what feels like a good use of our time and what might feel more wasteful. Or, we might just discover that some choices are actually being made for us. For example, when an algorithm queues up a never-ending cycle of videos, just like the one you just watched. Generally, we feel our best when our choices help us achieve a healthy balance between all the awesome things life has to offer. Sometimes it's nice to be productive, and sometimes it's nice just to sit back and relax. But remember, it's all about balance. So how do you spend your precious time? All right, so obviously you want kids here to really think about how they spend their time. So the first thing we do is we ask them to think about how much time do you think you spend using digital media on a typical weekend or summer day? Think of all the different ways that digital media they just listed is used and write your time estimate in your books or keep it to yourself. So we really want them to reflect on how digital media is just seeps into our life in so many different ways. And sometimes we don't even know that it is. we're using smartwatches, we're using Siri, all these things that are part of our life today. Um, okay, so every cyber civics lesson has an activity. They're all hands-on activities. For this one, we start out by having the students make a list of at least 25 non-screen activities they would do if they had no access to screens or digital media sort of like a bucket list, just imagine, you know, lights out, no, no electricity, no digital media, what would you do? And so they make this bucket list. Here's an example of a list that one of the students made. All right, the homework then is they have to choose one day on the weekend and keep a diary of how they spend their time on that day. They write down everything they do from the moment they wake up, from the moment they go to sleep. And in order to do this activity, we give them two options. We have a time tracker in the curriculum that you can download and give to the kids, or I do it the old fashioned way. I, I do it in their books. I say, take your book home and just write down a diary of how you spend your time from the minute you wake up to the minute you go to sleep. Uh, then when they come back to the class the next week, they have to uh, sort their data into different categories and make these little bar charts. Again, do it the high tech way. <laughs> On the left, we have a chart that you can give the kids to fill in or the low tech way, which is how I do it. I have the kids actually draw bar charts. And this might seem really, really simplistic, but when kids start to get a visual look at how they spend their time, it starts opening their eyes to, wow, gosh, I had no idea that took up so much of my day. So you want them to come to that realization and then talk about it with their peers. In your groups, share your charts and discuss these questions. 
What surprised you most about how you spent your time the least? What activities made you feel the best, the worst? What would you change, if anything, about how you spend your time? Write down your answers in your own books. All right, so now we've come to the next homework. This is the one, usually World War III breaks out when I assign this. It's a screen, screen free vacation. <laughs> they have to avoid looking at screens or using digital media for 24 hour period over the weekend. When they say, there's no way I can survive, you say, well, that's because that, well, that's why you made your 25 screen free activity list. Look back at your bucket list and check off the things that you can do in those 24 hours. And perhaps you wanna make it a game with your students to see who could do the most activities on their screen free list. Um, but the purpose is they have to just see what life was like 24 hours without media and write a little paragraph about the experience. Was it good? Was it bad? Was it difficult? Was it illuminating? What did you learn? So here's a little example of what I get from one of my students. Last Saturday, I went 24 hours without media. It was difficult because my life revolves so much around media. Instead, I had to do other things like play with my dogs or walk at the park or even go for bike rides with my family. The best thing about doing this is after a while, you start to feel calm and relaxed. I believe all people should go 24 hours without media. So this is pretty typical what I get from students. And it just tells me that this is a generation that really does not know life without screens. They just don't know it. It's just part of their everyday existence, no matter, even for families who try to restrict media, they're gonna see it somewhere. They're gonna hear about it somewhere. So we have to remember that giving them a little break from this is really a gift. I tell you, the students ask me to do this more than once a year. So really fun way to kick off the year. Um, as I showed you earlier, we have parent letters that go home with activities and we ask the parents to also go 24 hours without media. It never goes so well, <laughs> honestly. I got this from one of my students. First of all, my parents are weak. They could not separate from their devices. It made it really hard for me to do because they did not pay attention to me. I think it would have been easier if they did it with me. So we have to really remember that we are the role models when it comes to how we use our devices. Okay, unit two, uh, it's just two lessons in this unit as well. It's online safety. We want the kids to use their tools safely before they start doing research. So we teach them some of the things they should look out for, everything from spam, phishing, malware, pop-ups. And we do this really via playing games. For example, we have a red light, green light game. So in, in your resources, we have ways that kids can make their own lights. And we give you a bunch of scenarios that you can read to the kids. For example, Rosa is at Starbucks doing homework on her laptop computer. She has logged into the coffee shop's public Wi-Fi. Rosa gets bored and decides to check one of her social networks when she sees something she wants to buy. She has a brand new debit card and sees no harm in using it. So you ask the kids to hold up the light they think is appropriate to the situation. And then you can have a discussion about the correct answer. What light do you think Rosa should choose? Answer, red. And then it gives you kind of a script. And, and again, like these lessons are not about talking at kids about these scenarios. You wanna engage them because they may have experiences like this that they wanna share. Some of these, there's not really a strict red, yellow, or green answer. So again, this is what the beauty is of cyber civics is you're going to talk about scenarios that the kids are living in their real life. And it's a chance for them to have a place to talk about it and to maybe make mistakes or think about consequences before they go online and start doing that stuff in a place where it's public and permanent. All right, unit three is when we get into the actual information literacy lesson, searching the web. I am always struck at how little kids know about how to use the internet for research. So we start with the real basics, like elements of a web search. How does it work? How is Google able to find you what you need so darn fast? So we talk about that, how does search work? Constructing a search query. I've got that lesson I'm gonna show you in a minute. And then how do you read a results page? Kids get all these results and on this page, you've got ads, you've got sponsored content. How do you know what to choose for your research? And then finally, why can't I just cut and paste what I find? Like that's plagiarism, right? So we teach the kids what plagiarism is and how to avoid it via paraphrasing. All right, so these are the, the um, slides that go along with constructing a search query lesson. Um, this one, start with the basics. When a user enters, what the user enters into a search engine to help it locate what they're looking for. That is what a search query is. So, um, Talk to the students about this. While algorithms used by search engines are getting better and better every day at understanding what we're looking for when we type words into a search box, 
They're not foolproof. We have to construct the best search queries we can in order to help search engines retrieve the best matches for us. So the, the lesson that preceded this, the kids learned what keywords were. They did some basics that kind of make sense when they get to this lesson. Um, so here's an example. Here's a search query. What part of Turkey do people like best? What would you get if you type that into Google? Well, let's see. So you have here parts of the turkey, the kind of turkey you eat. What's the tastiest part of the turkey? But yet you also have 10 best places to visit in Turkey. Well, if you were um, a student doing a research paper on the country turkey, learning about what to eat on the turkey isn't going to be very helpful to you. So you want to write a better search query. So how would you do that? Well, in this lesson, we walk kids through the four steps of writing a good search query. And again, this is the lesson plan and the slides. So the first step is to pick out the keywords. And again, in the previous lesson, they have learned what keywords are. Um, and to remember that search engines convert all terms to lowercase when they index pages. So you do not have to capitalize turkey. Number two, there might be different ways of expressing certain words. For this step, underlining those words and write in a new word. So for example, like best is underlined because Google doesn't know what to do with those two words separately. So there's a better word and that better word is favorite. Number three, add missing words. Is there any missing information? Remember, you want to find answers related to the country turkey. So the word country is missing. So obviously we add the word country to our search query. And then finally, you want to get rid of unnecessary words and symbols. Eliminate small or unnecessary words by crossing them out. Finally, there's your search query. Words are reordered, but it is not necessary to do this. So Google does not recognize order and it does not recognize upper and lowercase. So there's a better search query. What would you get if you type that in? There you go. You would get the, the country turkey rather than the turkey you eat. So very simple activity teaches kids these one, two, three, four steps that they can use when they start searching the internet. All right, and kind of the summation here is searching is a process and sometimes it might take a few tries to write the perfect query. Always look at your results and ask yourself, how can I make my query better? Practice what you learn. All right, so that leads us into unit four, your personal information. The reason that we follow this follow searching with this is, as you know, every time we use Google to search, Google is collecting our personal information. And it's using that information to customize our searches and to give us ads of, of things that it thinks we want to buy. So that is part of this whole big picture of information literacy. So we've got quite a few lessons in here. Who's watching you? Privacy policies, understanding terms of use. Algorithms are awesome, or are they? That's such an important lesson. We just added it this year because kids they know what an algorithm is by, by the name of the word, but they have no idea how they work. Uh, protecting your online data, what makes a password great, and finally, what would you collect? So um, I'm going to show you quickly the privacy policy lesson. Kids really have fun with this one, believe it or not. And first of all, we talk about the reasons why personal information is collected. And there's a bunch of reasons why. To customize what the content we see, to improve the services, to provide targeted advertising, to be able to use user content as part of advertising and marketing campaigns, to infer additional information about you, to communicate with you about technical issues, et cetera. So then we talk about the terminology of privacy policies. This is the vocabulary of today. And in level two of cyber civics, there's a lot of vocabulary and we kind of help you out with that. In the student packet, it's got their vocabulary words really encourage you to integrate this throughout the rest of your, your week because this is the kind of vocabulary kids are going to run across every single day. For example, cookies. These are small computer text files placed in your computer by the sites you visit. Cookies allow websites to remember your personal data. Web beacons, a tiny graphic image placed on a website or in an email that is used to monitor the behavior of the user visiting the site or sending the email, often used in combination with cookies. Biometrics, how about this? Biometric identifiers or information, data about people's faces, voices, gestures, and more. These can be physical or behavioral. So this might seem like mumbo jumbo, but these are the words in our privacy policies that we all agree to every single day. It's important because this is how our personal information is collected. So we should be aware of how this happens. 
Um, so for the activity for this lesson, we actually have kids play a little game. It's a hunt and seek game. So they have to hunt and seek for these vocabulary words they just used in the privacy policy. So this year we're going to do TikTok and we chose TikTok because it is in a lot hotter hot water right now with the FCC for its privacy practices that we want the kids to discover that for themselves. They might think twice about using the app perhaps after taking a closer look at it. So anyway, it's a, it's a hunt and seek game they do together to find some of those terms that we just talked about. And then we talk about what they learn. Was there anything in the policy that was of particular concern to you? Do you think what the company collects from users is a fair exchange for the service they give in return? That's an important topic. And you could really spend almost a whole class period just having a discussion about that. Seventh graders have a lot to say about that, by the way. All right. The next lesson is terms of use, which is a whole nother part of user agreements that we talk about and that we look, we all agree to when we use different services online. So this one we do a little differently. We introduce them to some more terms, but now they have to work together to write the terms of use of Instagram in plain English. So a lot of writing in this class as well. Um, you would think this would be so boring for kids, but they love these two lessons. And I'm gonna show you, I'm not gonna tell you, we had a, a camera crew visit us one year after they had done these lessons and they were so excited to talk about privacy policies. And I've got a little clip here to share with you. That it is really extraordinary, guys. Good morning to all of you. With Mark Zuckerberg now accepting some of the blame for that massive Facebook data breach, it has become painfully clear how much information we all give up about ourselves online. Now with an entire generation of kids growing up with social media as familiar as a good old PB&J, one program is trying to teach them how to protect their data online before it's too late. With Facebook facing fresh backlash for sharing people's personal information without their consent, these kids in California are reading the fine print. Yeah, we've been learning about like privacy policies and terms of agreement. It freaked you out? Yeah. Yeah, yeah it did. Like, you guys have friends in seventh grade, obviously, outside yes. of this yeah. school and yes. outside of your class. Yeah. Do any of them read the terms of agreement on social no. media? No. <laughs> I know. Yeah, but they admit they feel the pull. Who texts? Oh. oh. Everybody. <laughs> Everybody texts. Who FaceTimes? FaceTime. Oh, yeah, definitely. And in this class, their devices aren't a distraction. They're their homework. What is this homework assignment? Um, it's a digital diet. Wait a minute, you guys made charts? Yeah. Olivia did a lot of sleeping, 12 hours. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. How many hours a day were you using digital media? Uh, well, I was using eight hours a day, which was pretty surprising to me. So more than half of the hours yeah, you were awake, you're on digital was, media. It was crazy. It seems the phones so many of us hold have a hold over us. 12 and a half hours total. Yeah, I was like, oh, I should probably actually do something. <laughs> yeah. Maybe your teacher, Diana Graber, did. Think back to your previous digital diets. Creating this class, now taught in 34 states. You teach a class called Cyber Civics. Yeah. What is that? Well, it's... Um, oh, sorry. Let me... Um, turn off the... It's learning how to use your devices respectfully... And see that? ...and thoughtfully. There you go. <laughs> There's a class happening in a few hours. Let's try that again. When you walk around at the school here, do the kids look at you and say, that's the teacher who wants to take away our phones? No, 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 no. That's the teacher that lets us talk about our phones. One in three kids uses a phone before they can talk. By the time they're teens, they're on it 11 hours a day. But are smartphones making us smarter? Think of it this way. This guy, the goldfish's attention span is only about nine seconds. Since 2000, remember flip phones? The average human's attention span dropped from 12 to just eight seconds. That's right, our attention span is now shorter than a goldfish's. And that's not all the science says. Before internet addicted, and look, pretty dramatic, right? <laughs> In this MRI machine, Dr. David Rosenberg, chief psychiatrist at Children's Hospital of Michigan, says he can see a difference. Look at what's happening in the brain's arousal reward system. Today, he's studying two triplets, Noah and Samantha. She, like most 14-year-olds, won't put her phone down. But the MRIs reveal only Noah is hooked. He stopped playing Minecraft, but he's replaced it with Xbox. But I'm more active now. You're standing up and playing? What do you mean you're more active? And the brain on games looks a lot like a brain on drugs. 
they've found ways, just like with nicotine and tobacco, to hook us. Dr. Rosenberg recommends just two hours total of online time for teens. And that assumes that all homework and chores have been completed. Back at Journey School, students admit it's a process. My project is Music of the Renaissance. So I'm looking on YouTube, looking for the most popular songs. So then I get Let me guess, when you're on YouTube, you're not always looking at Music of the Renaissance videos. And then something will pop up and be like... All of a sudden you're listening to... Like a banana song by the Minions. A banana song by the Minions. Oh, yeah. Still, their teacher, Diana Graber, is optimistic. I hope they go out there and that they use their devices in powerful, wonderful ways. The ways that, you know, a lot of us forget they're designed to do. So holy moly, this stuff is no joke addictive and there are lots of side effects, but there are a few simple things actually we can all do to keep kids safe in the digital world and enjoying life in the real world, which is. So uh, I, I played that whole thing because I wanted you to see how it relates to information literacy. Those kids were doing research on their phones and computers and got distracted by all the other things that the computer offers. So that's why we spend so much time in these classes talking about time. And when you get to level three, we really talk about how these devices capture and hold their attention. But um, so many different ways that they remember this content. For that particular day, we had just finished looking at the privacy policies of Snapchat and those kids sitting at the table, uh, four of the five deleted Snapchat from their phones. And I can't say it was off forever, but it really made them think twice about the personal information that was being collected from them, from their devices. And that leads us to the final conversations that we have in this unit. Based on what you know now, do you feel being tar how do you feel about being targeted online? Do you think the benefits of being targeted with customized content and ads outweigh the downsides of companies knowing so much about you? What could be some possible consequences to society from filter bubbles? In a filter bubble, if you don't know, you will teach it to the kids in this unit, but that's this, the um, intellectual isolation that happens when we're fed information that's exactly like information we've already looked at. So we're not really getting a wide variety of um, thoughts and ideas and content coming to us from the internet because of the information they've collected about us that customizes our searches. So I hope that makes sense while, why this is such an, an important part of information literacy. Um, there's more too, <laughs> so the next level. Equally important, knowing about copyright, fair use and public domain. And we put this here because now that kids are starting to use the computer as an information source, they're gonna run across a lot of creative works that are tempting to use or copy. And this stuff is protected by copyright. So they need to know about this law. So we talk about what copyright is. We talk about an alternative to copyright, which is Creative Commons. We talk about some exceptions to copyright, public domain, fair use and remixing. So. To start out, you tell kids copyright law is very important. The rights of creative artists are protected by copyright law. This law ensures artists get credit for or even paid for their work. Copyright law goes into effect the moment an artist records a creative work by writing it down, taking a photo, shooting a video, uploading a post. So that's really important. But I mean, you own your work the minute you put it down in writing or even post it to the internet. So. In order to really get the kids where they are, we give them a relevant example. Uh, Fortnite, which is an online game that kids, if they don't play it, they've heard about it likely. And in 2018, Epic Games, the developer of Fortnite, they were sued for stealing dance moves without permission and accused of exploiting artists' talent without credit. So they were accused of a copyright violation. So we talk about that. And then for this lesson, we want an activity that is relevant to the kids. So we have them create their own creative work. So we put kids again in little teams of students. Every group has to come up with their own original dance moves. Since dance moves, dance often needs music. You can come up with your own original music too. No copyright infringements in this class. This can be a very simple dance with a simple tune, even lyrics. You can use music, musical instruments or even just clap your hands. The goal is to work together to make something that is truly original, creative, and your very own. So they have a ton of fun with us. The kids will make their little dances. If there's a shy student that doesn't want to do it, they can be the person who videotapes it. But basically, we want them to tape it or take a video record of it because that proves that it is a creative work that is protected by copyright. And I love this. We ran across this on um, Instagram. It's a school that teaches cyber civics. Their kids did this lesson and they put it on on their little post that said, 
Shawnee Mountain Wald are seventh graders inventing original dance moves for the cyber civics class on copyright. We try to keep things fun. So obviously these kids are having a lot of fun with this lesson. But there's a lot of learning that goes along with this too, because once they have their video of their dance moves, you know, here's the thing about creative artists today. A lot of especially young people don't want their work completely protected by copyright because they might want people to share it with others because it might get them noticed or it might get them other work or that might they love to share and collaborate with others online. And so there's this whole new aspect to copyright that has popped up in the last decade or so called Creative Commons. You may have seen some of those licenses online. Uh, you, will, you will introduce them to your students, but it's a more current way of copyright so that artists can share and use each other's creative works. So that's why you want your kids to have their own creative work because for this activity, they will get to choose which Creative Commons license to use for their dance moves. And they will write it on a little note card and interpret the license on the back. So it's kind of a relevant way for them to think about these new variations to copyright. It's also important for them to know that there's some exceptions to copyright in addition to fair use and um, public domain. We teach them two more current modern day ones, which are the mashup or remix. Uh, believe it or not, when you mash something up or you remix something, it is now protected by copyright because it's different from the original. So in order for kids to understand this concept, they do a little art project. They love this one too. So they have to create a piece of art. They can draw it use whatever tools they have at hand. Um, but the whole idea is they have to make a piece of art that they really love and are proud of. And then when they're finished, they take a picture of it. So they bring that piece of art to school and then the teacher cuts it up into 20 little pieces. So they add up all the little pieces in the front of the room and kids take as many of it as they need to create a mashup or a remix art. So I hope that makes sense if it doesn't. This is an original piece of art that one of my students created. She brought it to class. We cut it up along with what her classmates brought in. And then every student created a remix or mashup of the original piece of art. And the purpose here to show them that while well, what's on the left is created by, is protected by copyright, so is what's on the right, because it is a new and different piece of art from the original. So fun way to introduce them to this concept. All right, finally, our last units on Wikipedia. Um, whenever you do a search online, generally the first thing that pops up is from Wikipedia. So kids need to learn how to use this new resource. A lot of teachers will just tell kids not to use it at all. And I think that's a mistake. There's a lot of really great things on a Wikipedia page that will be helpful to a child doing some research. So we talk about why wikis work. What is collaborative thinking? Why is it better when a bunch of people think of things think of a topic together rather than just one expert. So we talk about that. And then we explore a Wikipedia page. We actually look at the content. We, you know, the kids have to be able to identify what's on the page and what they can use and what's useful for their research. And a lot of times the best stuff is at the bottom. The re references and external links is sometimes a goldmine of information about their topic. And then at the end of the year, you'll do a collaborative final. Um, because you have just talked about collective thinking within the Wikipedia uh, unit, this is a, called a collaborative final where the kids work together to come to the answers that you will ask them. So it's really fun, hard to grade, but really fun because um, when the kids get this test, they can answer the question themselves, but if they don't know the answer, they're allowed to ask a classmate, but they have to cite their source. So if their source is another classmate, they have to write that down and then they would get the point for a right answer and the source would also get a point for providing the answer. So it's a lot of fun, they work together and it just proves that kids learn and retain information better when they're doing it collaboratively. All right, so I did level two really fast. It's a pretty packed year, but um, it will make them better researchers and teach them those really basic skills they need to use the internet to find, retrieve, analyze and use online information. So. Um, if you have any questions, remember as a subscriber to CyberCivics, you always get com complimentary screen shares. So if a teacher has a question, just reach out to us. And we also offer teacher workshops and parent presentations. So happy to offer those at any time. All right. Thank you and have fun teaching CyberCivics.